knowledge in the area of male infertility with you over the last several weeks. And I really hope you have enjoyed the opportunity to interact and to learn more about male infertility. The last lesson is about the medical and surgical treatment of male infertility in the era of ICSI. So I will be uh, focusing on the medical treatment of male infertility as well as in the surgical treatment of male infertility. You see the agenda in the screen. Obviously, we have already discussed some of these topics in previous lessons. So I will focus in the topics that we haven't discussed so far to add more value to you and also for allowing us to have some time for questions and answers. So if you, we go back to the male infertility etiology and uh, when we actually uh, evaluated the distribution of male infertility categories in our center, as you can see, we can have, let's say, several infertility etiologies with a potential opportunity for treatment. So according to our data, about 50% of patients have potentially treatable conditions that you need to know more about it in order to be able to offer the patients or at least discuss with the patient the opportunity for treatment. Concerning medical treatment of male infertility, we have the empirical treatment for idiopathic oligoasthenoteratozospermia. We can discuss obesity-related hypogonadism and OAT. Endocrine disorders mostly focused on hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, which we have discussed in the last lesson. I will skip that point because we have already uh, discussed about that. I will go through male genital threat infection and also male oxidative stress infertility, which is a new category of uh, medical treatment opportunity that we have in our hands. Concerning the empirical medical treatment of idiopathic OAT, it's important for you to know that we do not have evidence-based literature to support any empirical treatment for idiopathic OAT. Androgens, gonadotropins, aromatase inhibitors, anti-estrogens or any estrogen modulator, bromocriptin, alpha blockers, and corticosteroids have been used over the years by several investigators, and they are in general not effective to overcome idiopathic oligoasthenoteratozospermia, with very few exceptions. So the best option for patients with idiopathic OAT is actually IVF and ICSI. This is an important key message we need to kind of communicate to our patients in order to avoid delay in treatment, especially in ICSI area, in which we have the opportunity to provide patients with idiopathic oligoastenoteratozospermia a fair chance of success using IVF and ICSI. However, as I said, there are some conditions in which you could consider providing medical therapy. For instance, if you have an obese patient, and we know that obese men is twice as likely to be infertile as normal weight men, there are several epidemiological studies indicating that the higher the BMI, the lower the chance of achieving natural pregnancy, not only the, in the ob obesity side, but also in the overweight side, meaning that men with BMI higher than 25, they will have lower chance of achieving pregnancy as compared to men with normal BMI. There are several actually conditions that could impact fertility in overweight and obese men including physical disorders, such as the accumulation of fat tissue in, uh, in the pub area, 
genetic disorders, hormonal disorders, all these conditions actually could result in erectile dysfunction and also altered seminal parameters causing infertility. For instance, the accumulation of fat tissue in obese men in the pubic area, in the scrotal area, will increase the temperature. Secondly, there is accumulation of chemicals in the fat tissue that could also cause a direct effect on spermatogenesis. We have also aromatase conversion of testosterone to estradiol, which also occurs in the fat tissue. And estradiol will have a negative impact on the secretion of gonadotropin releasing hormones and consequently FSH and LH secretion with the final result of decreasing testosterone levels. Leptin, a very important hormone also produced by the fat tissue, will have a direct impact on spermatogenesis. So there are several actually interconnecting factors playing a significant role for infertility in obese men in particular, but also overweight men. The fact is that the studies indicate that sperm production is lower in obese men. So sperm count is one issue that you find in this patient category, but not only the conventional sperm parameters, but there are several reports indicating that oxidative stress, DNA integrity, apoptosis, proteomic markers are altered in obese and overweight men compared with normal weight men. So it means that not only conventional semen parameters, but also sperm functional parameters will be affected by obesity. So in this patient categories, there are treatment modalities that we might consider such as lifestyle changes, using diet and exercise. There are pharmacological interventions, including appetite suppressors, weight loss drugs, and aromatase inhibitors. We will discuss more about that in a minute. There are surgical interventions, and obviously we can offer these patients ART. So the question you might ask is, does weight loss improve semen quality? Well, uh, the truth is we have few data in the literature evaluating this very important question. But some studies indicate that weight loss could actually increase sperm count. This is a, a small cohort study, including obese men with BMI over 33, in which this patient were, were put on a healthy diet and daily exercise for 14 weeks. As you can see, the changes in the total sperm count that you can see in this graph were actually related to the amount of weight loss in this patient population. If the weight loss was up to 12%, there was some increase in sperm count, but not so significantly. But when the weight loss was between 12 and 17%, or over 17%, the authors observed that the total sperm count were actually significantly increased. Also, total testosterone levels, which are normally in the lower levels in overweight and obese patients, improved. All these conditions could actually be affecting fertility at the end of the day, so you could actually uh, provide better opportunity for this patient population just by changing the lifestyle. Observe that sperm DNA fragmentation in this study were quite normal, so there was no significant effect in DFI in this small cohort study. 
So one thing we need to consider is that a reason why total testosterone levels are in general lower or in the lower limits in overweight and obese men is because testosterone is converted to estradiol by aromatase in the adipocyte. So if you have a patient in which oligosospermia is present and the patient is overweight or obese, you can discuss with the patient the opportunity to give the patients aromatase inhibitors. In our center, Androfert, we use an estrazole, one milligrams once a day for about 60 days for this sort of patients. This is off-label treatment, but we found that it could actually be helpful for some selected overweight and obese men. The only thing you need to do to decide if the patient is eligible for treatment is to measure total testosterone levels and estradiol levels. So it's important that the testosterone to estradiol ratio, which normally is above 10, should be actually measured using nanograms per deciliter concerning testosterone and picograms per ml concerning estradiol. So if in your centers, you do not use these units, you need to convert, first of all, testosterone and estradiol to make the ratio. Only then you'll be able to use the threshold of 10 to kind of distinguish patient with abnormal testosterone to estradiol ratio, which will be the ones with testosterone to estradiol ratios below 10, does indicating that these patients have aromatase hyperactivity. There's too much conversion of testosterone to estradiol. And as I said before, estradiol will actually cause negative feedback in the pituitary, thus decreasing FSH and LH secretion, ultimately affecting testosterone production. So one option for you in this case is using any aromatase inhibitors. In our case, we prefer an estrozole because the availability of the drug in our, in our scenario. The studies looking at the effect of aromatase inhibitors in patients, in male infertility patients with obesity, has shown that testosterone to estradiol ratio actually normalize after treatment. This is a, a study in which the authors treated the, the group of men for about three to six months, you see that there was an increasing ejaculate volume and also a significant increase in sperm count. That could actually offer the patient perhaps to downsize the type of assisted reproduction we are offering them, perhaps allowing these men to go for IUI or eventually achieving natural pregnancy. Another opportunity that you might consider for obese and o uh, overweight men with hypogonadism. So remember, hypogonadism, we define as total testosterone below 300 nanograms per deciliter. And in particular, in the case of overweight and obese men, when we have testosterone to estradiol ratios below 10, you might actually give these patients HCG treatment to actually stimulate the Liebig cells to produce more testosterone with a positive effect on spermatogenesis. In our case, we prefer recombinant HCG and the patients take subcutaneous self-injections of the prefilled syringe or with the pen and then you need to titrate the dose, starting with low doses. Usually I start with 1,000 international units twice a week, and I monitor testosterone and estradiol levels to kind of improve the total testosterone and the spermatogenesis. Again, this is off-label medication that you need to discuss with the patients in advance. 
I know several doctors like to use anti-estrogens like clomiphene citrate and other drugs to actually increase testosterone levels in men with idiopathic oligoasthenoteratosospermia, including overweight and obese patients. A note of caution actually needs to be communicated for those willing to use these drugs, because although they are less expensive than HCG and also aromatase inhibitors, there is a yes, proportion of patients that will actually have higher than ideal total testosterone levels after taking, for instance, in this study, clomiphene citrate, as you can see, the, thresh, the, the ceiling level should be 800, and about 25% of patients actually have levels above the ceiling after chromophene citrate treatment, 25 milligrams per day for three months. And these high levels of testosterone will be supraphysiological, thus causing negative central feedback that will decrease intratesticular testosterone. And as a consequence, sperm count will actually be decreased rather than increased. So if you decide to use anti-estrogens, please check the hormone levels every three months because you, need, you might need to tailor the dosage or even stop the medication. So in our scenario, we prefer either aromatase inhibitors or HCG because we can control better and the patients experience fewer side effects. So for men with obesity-related male infertility, in conclusion, we could offer diet and exercise. There's some evidence that that could in improve sperm count. We can give medication, specifically aromatase inhibitors, in which we have more evidence. There are some studies actually suggesting that bariatric surgery could help these patients, but the results are conflicting. And some studies actually suggest that semen parameters could even go down after bariatric surgery, in particular when the FOBI Capella procedure is utilized. So in our center, every time a patient, uh, obese patient come uh, uh, saying that he's gonna be put on bariatric surgery, we discuss with the patient the opportunity to freeze sperm because there is a risk of this patient actually become azospermic after the phobic capella procedure. And remember, the uh, ART outcomes in patients, in male patients with obesity, are actually decreased compared with normal weight men. Both clinical pregnancy rates and live birth rates are actually lower in this patient population. So every effort we could make to make these patients uh, better in terms of the lifestyle, diet, exercise, medication could actually improve ART outcomes for those patients actually treated by this assisted reproduction modality. Now I want to move to male genital tract infection. And I'm skipping, as I said before, endocrine disorders because we have discussed hypogonadotropic hypogonadism last week. So let's uh, focus on infection. And as a matter of fact, 10 to 20% of the infertile male population, they have asymptomatic urethritis or prostatitis. These conditions are usually caused by aerobic bacteria, but could also be caused by other agents, such as chlamydia, ureoplasma, and mycoplasma, and in some cases, Neisseria as well. So the issue is that to identify infection is not so straightforward using semen culture because semen has zinc, 
and zinc has antibacterial properties that will turn the semen cultures negative in over 80% of cases. So semen culture is not a good, let's say, uh, method to identify infect, subclinical infection. By contrast, leukocytes are marker of reproductive tract inflammation. And these leukocytes could be easily detected in semen analysis. So leukocytospermia, or if you like, pyospermia, refers to over 1 million leukocytes per ml of semen. Leukocytes could be the granulocytes, macrophages, and lymphocytes. But in particular, the granulocytes, they are very active in terms of reactive oxygen species production. And in fact, granulocytes make 100 times more ROS than defective sperm. So leukocytes are the primary source of reactive oxygen species in the male reproductive tract. As you know, ROS will cause oxidative stress and excessive oxidative stress will affect membrane lipid peroxidation, thus affecting sperm motility, and also nuclear and mitochondrial DNA damage, thus affecting the sperm chromatin integrity. <clears throat> so the easiest way to identify subclinical infection is by running the peroxidase test. The peroxidase this test is very easy to perform in the laboratory. It can be done in conjunct conjunction with the conventional semen analysis. So the first step, you just look at if you can see round cells in the chamber. So it could be round cells that you will count using the chambers that you utilize for semen analysis. And if it's over 1 million per ml, we need to verify if the round cells are actually granulocytes or other uh, round cells. Round cells, as you know, could be also immature germ cells. So it's important to make differentiation between the cellular elements. So what we do in the peroxidase test is actually we incubate 20 microliters of semen with 20 microliters of a buffer, with 40 microliters of benzidine with a substrate and also hydrogen peroxide. So wait for 15 minutes. And after that, we will actually observe again in the, in the bright field microscopy if the round cells actually turn brown because the granulocytes, they contain Gran, uh, granulose of hydrogen peroxide that we will interact with the solutions that we actually use in the peroxidase test. And this reaction will make the cells brown. That could be easily identified by bright field optical microscopy. So then you count the number of peroxidase positive cells and make your estimation. If it's over 1 million per ml, then you make the diagnosis of leukocytospermia. And in this condition, you should actually provide treatment. You can use several antibiotics. In our uh, scenario, we prefer azithromycin with some macrolide. We use one gram single dose for the couple. And we ask the patient to have frequent ejaculation every two to three days. This antibiotic will be able to overcome most of the bacteria actually affecting uh, the urethra and also the prostate. In this study, in which we look at the leukocytospermia resolution, we found that this very simple treatment was able to completely normalize leukocytes in 42% of patients. If the number of leukocytes more is not 
ideal after treatment, you might consider actually uh, including anti steroid inflammatory drugs as well as antioxidants, or in selected case, you can change the antibiotic therapy. So by using this regimen, we were able to show that the number of leukocytes was significantly reduced after treatment, and also this permotility was significantly increased. So you should consider giving antibiotic treatment for patients with subclinical infections that you can easily identify in the semen analysis by providing the uh, peroxidase test to differentiate between leukocytes, granulocytes in particular, and other round cellular elements. So the last point I want to discuss with you in terms of medical treatment is in male oxidative stress infertility, which is quite prevalent in the male infertility populations we see in our clinics these days. There are several conditions that cause oxidative stress, including infections, as we just discussed, also lifestyle factors, including obesity, smoking, use of drugs, environmental and occupational exposure to toxicants, varicocele, and also systemic pathologies, including diabetics, metabolic syndrome, cancer, and systemic infection. So, as you know well, oxidative stress plays a significant role in the etiology of male infertility. ROS, which stands for reactive oxygen species, are produced mainly by leukocytes, but also by abnormal and immature sperm. And according to several studies, 30 to 80% of infertile men have oxidative stress that could be potentially treated. So ideally, we should measure oxidative stress in semen before offer patients treatment. So we can do measurement in two ways. You can either measure oxidative stress directly in the semen by using tests in which evaluate ROS levels, or you can use a simple test as the one showing here, which is called oxidative reduction potential, which is a, a very simple device in which you just load a small amount of semen in the cartridge, you just insert the cart cartridge in the reading machine, and the machine will calculate the oxidation reduction potential, which will be the balance between oxidants and reductants, and you have an evaluation of the level of oxidative stress. This test is more and more available in several parts of the world, and I think. It's a valid addition and very inexpensive way to measure oxidative stress. Another way to measure oxidative stress is indirect measurement by looking at the final effect of oxidative stress in the sperm DNA integrity. So in that case, you may, we can measure sperm DNA fragmentation. And then after actually confirming that oxidative stress is existent, we will be able to offer the patient treatment that could be lifestyle modification, antioxidant therapy, or any other treatment that could actually help these patients overcome oxidative stress. For instance, patient with varicocele, we might offer varicocelectomy. We will discuss that in this, in, in this talk. And the important thing is that using these tests, you can retest the patients two to three months later and then realize if actually the, the treatment made any effect. So then we can move forward offering patients an opportunity to do expectant management or ART according to the test results. So the empiric use of antioxidants, which is actually a common practice nowadays 
is okay, but you need to realize that excessive vitamins could be actually detrimental for selected patients. For instance, if you use high dose of vitamin C, you could actually cause more oxidative stress, according to some studies. And it's important also to remember that not all sperm DNA fragmentation is caused by oxidative stress. So in patients in which sperm DNA fragmentation is caused by protamination defects or apoptosis, well, use of oral antioxidants might not offer any benefit. So ideally, we should offer these patients a test in which you confirm that there's a problem related to oxidative stress. Or if you don't have the test to offer, please consider if the patient is at risk of oxidative stress, such as patients having varicocele, having obesity, having exposure to toxicants, environmental and occupational, very, uh, um, varicocele, as I said, also take some, some medication. Uh, is, these patients actually are those at risk of oxidative stress, systemic disease, etc. And then you can give empirical oral antioxidant treatment. If possible, test the patient before actually providing these patients any treatment. When you give an oral antioxidant, it's important to understand that the mechanism of actions of oral antioxidants comprise both enzymatic and non-enzymatic properties. So enzymatic antioxidants, they enhance the already present antioxidant enzymes that could be reduced in infertile. You, we can also use non-enzymatic or scavenging antioxidants. And then we have water-soluble and lipid-soluble antioxidants. So it's important that in your prescription, you combine as much as possible both enzymatic and non-enzymatic antioxidants because these agents, they have different functions that could actually work together to counteract oxidative stress. There are several studies suggesting that oral antioxidant can actually decrease oxidative stress and improve both sperm motility and DNA integrity for infertile men with oxidative stress. A very recent Cochrane review published this year, looking at the effect of oral antioxidant in IVF ICSI outcomes in patients, in male patients treated with antioxidants, showed that live birth rates were significantly higher among treated men compared to non-treated men. This study actually suggested that live birth could be two times higher, almost two times higher by giving oral antioxidants. Concerning the DFI, some of the studies, including the Cochrane uh, review, actually look at sperm DNA fragmentations before and after antioxidant treatment, and they showed that there's a reduction in DFI in about 5% uh, percentage points, but results were not significant, uh, although numerically there was some reduction. However, it's important to realize that in these studies, heterogeneity was quite high in terms of the type of antioxidants, duration of antioxidant use, and also patients selected for actually oral antioxidant therapy. What we do in our center, we actually developed a prescription in which we combine enzymatic and non-enzymatic antioxidants. So we ask the pharmacy to prepare the formulation that you see in the screen. This is also published in this uh, study that we published recently this year. 
and I included this study for you to check in the literature I shared with you. So if you are interested to look at this formulation in more detail, uh, I suggest you to you go for this study. This is the formulation that I'm using at the moment at Androford, and I use for at least three months. So every patient in which I feel it's candidate for oral antioxidant therapy because the patient is at risk or has confirmed oxidative stress, I put these patients on this formulation. However, it's also important to realize that an intervention alone might not be enough to actually overcome oxidative stress. We need actually to attack the problem from different angles. And lifestyle change is of utmost importance, including reducing weight, reducing smoking or quit smoking, avert from environmental and occupational toxicant exposure. These are important things. And also concerning using of several drugs in which patients actually use and abuse these days, such as antidepressants, such as testosterone replacement therapy. All of these drugs have been used by the male infertility population, often without prescription, and this will be associated with negative effect in terms of male infertility and chance of pregnancy. So in summary, there, there is now evidence suggesting that lifestyle changes are essential to help alleviate oxidative stress and they might improve sperm chromatin integrity. We have a data showing that environmental and occupational toxicants are associated with sperm DNA fragmentation, although we do not have clinical data about the effects of averting exposure on pregnancy outcomes. We have many publications on the negative effect of smoking on sperm function. However, we have very little data in terms of smoking cessation on the sperm DNA fragmentation. By contrast, we have data suggesting that dietary changes, weight loss, and stress control could actually reduce sperm DNA fragmentation, therefore improving fertility. So the key message for medical treatment of male infertility, number one, empirical medication is not recommended for men with idiopathic oligo astenoteratozoospermia in general, although we can consider giving medication for men, for overweight and or obese men with aromatase hyperactivity detected by a testosterone to estradiol ratio below 10. So if you have these patients with oligosospermia, you could consider giving aromatase inhibitors to help increase sperm count. Concerning subclinical infections, leukocytospermia is associated with oxidative stress and it will decrease sperm quality as a whole. And antibiotic therapy is helpful to decrease leukocyte count. However, the effect on fertility is unclear and also the effect of aromatase inhibitors on fertility is also unclear, although it will increase sperm count, we need more data to confirm that these interventions will actually improve fertility, both natural and assisted. Remember that oxidative stress is a major risk factor for male infertility, and that antioxidant therapy can counteract oxidative stress and improve both sperm motility and DNA integrity for infertile men with confirmed oxidative stress or at risk of oxidative stress. So the late, latest Cochrane review suggests that the chance of live birth among couples undergoing art seems to be increased by use of oral antioxidants, but the ideal oxidant 
regimen, duration, and dosage is still to be determined. Lastly, it's important for us to include lifestyle changes for our patient population suffering from infertility because these changes could help alleviate the negative effect of reactive oxygen species for infertility patients with oxidative stress. So now I want to move to my second point, which is the surgical treatment of male infertility. So in previous uh, webinars, we discussed about treatment for patients with obstructive azospermia. We in particular discussed briefly about resection of ejaculatory duct cysts or obstruction as a means to alleviate obstruction in a patient with obstructive azospermia. We also discussed briefly the role of reconstructive surgeries, in particular vasoexostomy and vasoepididymostomies for patients with obstructions affecting the vasoafferents. And we have also discussed in detail sperm retrieval techniques for both azospermic and non-azospermic men. Today, I want to focus on varicose repair, and I want also to focus on sperm retrieval in non-azospermic men. So first of all, let's start with varicose because this is a very prevalent condition in the patient population we see in our clinics. And varicose has been associated with several, actually, conditions that could impact the male reproductive potential. There are endocrine factors, testicular hypoxia, scrotal hyperthermia, reflux of metabolites, and cadmium accumulation. These conditions will actually provoke oxidative stress and will have a direct negative effect on spermatogenesis. Concerning oxidative stress, in this condition, we will have problems with membrane lipid peroxidation affect, in particular, sperm motility, and also nuclear and mitochondrial DNA fragmentation that will affect the male reproductive potential. Remember, Varicocele is dilation of the veins around the pampiniform plexus, as you can see in this illustration here. And we have discussed it before the diagnosis of varicocele, uh, how we should do it. But the important message is that the central element for varicocele pathophysiology is oxidative stress and production of reacted oxygen species occurs not only in the testicular parenchyma, but also in the epididymis and in the varicose veins surrounding the testicles. Concerning treatment, there are several different approaches that could be used to repair a varicose We can use the retroperitoneal, which is the high incision that you can see here in this illustration, laparoscopy, embolization, the inguinal approach, as you can see over here, and also subinguinal microsurgical varicoselectomy, which is illustrated here, the incision site. In this table, you can see the recurring, uh, the recurrency rates, postoperative hydrocele formation, which is a complication that sometimes happens with the varicoselectomy, and the natural pregnancy uh, rates according to different studies. So in our center, we always treat varicocele using the microsurgical sobing, you know, varicoselectomy because it is associated with very low recurrence rate, very low hydrocele formation, and with fairly good pregnancy rates. The importance of using the sobing, you know, approach is that, as you can see highlighted in this illustration, we will be able to identify and to treat most of the veins actually affecting or uh, being part of the varicocele disease. And only if we use the sambigno incision, we'll be able to identify these veins. However, several of the veins are very small and it's gonna be difficult to identify these veins without using some sort of magnification. 
So what we do is actually we do a varicoselectomy as an outpatient basis in which we actually stereoize the spermatic cord. We identify the vessels, dilated vessels. We identify the testicular artery. We identify the lymphatics, thus providing the patients actually the ideal treatment for varicoselectomy. What we do in our operations, we use the intraoperative microvascular Doppler, which is very convenient to identify the artery and preserve the arteries because this is very important to preserve the testicular function. In this a short movie, I will show you how we will actually do the microsurgical subingenal varicose seal repair at Androford. This is a patient with bilateral uh, varicose seal. So the first part is actually, we just mark the position of the external spermatic cord, and then we make an incision actually of about two centimeters below the external inguinal ring, as you can see here, marked. So it's about that size. And then we do the incision, and then we open the skin, the subcutaneous tissue. We stereoize the spermatic cord, and then we open the spermatic cord to start identifying the dilated veins. Here you can see a big vein that we can identify and we can actually transect the vein. It's very easy with the microscope to identify the dilated veins and also artery and the lymphatic. But sometimes we, if you are in doubt, if it's a vein or an artery, the intra, Operative Doppler ultrasound will help you to kind of make that decision because it's important to preserve the uh, the artery. Here you see a lymphatic vest, which is very easy to identify, which is also important to preserve to avoid hydrocele. Now I'm showing you the use of the intraoperative Doppler ultrasound. See, the arterial bit is very clear, and then we will we spare the testicular artery. Sometimes there are more than one, so we will be able to treat the vessels, dilated veins, and spare the testicular arteries. So what you see in the screen is a, a microsurgical uh, overview of the pampiniform plexus with the veins, the arteries, the lymphatics, using the sambignal approach. So this is very convenient and the operation goes until you actually treat all, all dilated veins and then you close the incision. We do this as an outpatient basis in the clinic using intravenous sedation and local anesthesia. Well, the treatment outcomes after varicose seal repair, according to several studies, indicates that we can improve sperm count, we can improve motility, and we can improve strict morphology. So improvement in at least one semen parameter occurs in about two thirds of treated men. The peak improvement is seen uh, after five months of the varicose selectomy. But I advise my patients that they should actually start monitoring the semen analysis after three months because this is a full cycle of spermatogenesis. So we start actually observing an increase in sperm count, motility, and morphology, as well as decreasing sperm DNA fragmentation. 
This is a study we published recently in which we look at the effect of varicose seal repair on sperm DNA fragmentation. In this paper, we actually were able to compile the evidence of more than 20 studies and more than 1,000 infertile men with varicose seal. And we observed that there was an equivocal decrease in sperm DNA fragmentation rates after varicose seal repair in the treated patients with palpable varicose seal. In all studies, the DNA fragmentation rates were decreased after varicoselectomy. In addition, the postoperative spread DNA fragmentation rates were significantly lower in men from couples who achieved pregnancy after varicoselectomy. And importantly, there was a concomitant reduction in oxidative stress markers after varicoselectomy, thus stressing the association between varicocele oxidative stress, and sperm DNA fragmentation. Also in these studies, in this study by our group, we look at the effect of vertical seal repair on sperm DNA fragmentation, taking a meta-analytic approach. In this paper, we look at 19 studies and more than 1,000 men. And what we found was that sperm DNA fragmentation was reduced by approximately eight percentile points. So the mean difference was less 8% sperm DNA fragmentation in absolute values in men treated by varicocele. And when we stratify the results by the type of assay utilized for sperm DNA fragmentation assessment, sperm chromatin structure assay or the tunnel assay, which were the tests utilized in most of the studies, included in this meta-analysis, we showed that in both conditions, there was a significant reduction of sperm DNA fragmentation after varicoselectomy. We also look at, in different publications, in the effect of varicocele repair on natural pregnancy outcome. There is a, uh, the Cochrane, the latest Cochrane reveal in 2012, including 10 randomized controlled trials, indicating that the odds ratio for natural pregnancy is increased by 1.447 in patients treated. However, it's even important to look at the subpopulation with clinical varicose seal. I mean, varicose seals that the doctor can identify in the physical examination and that these varicocils were associated with abnormal semen parameters. As you can see, the odds ratio was amplified, thus stressing the importance of adequate patient selection for varicocelectomy. In this uh, meta-analysis, the pregnancy rates, excluding case with associated female factors, in terms of natural pregnancy was Pregnancy rates were of 43% at one year follow up and 69% at two year follow up. But as I said before, our results are dependent on the technique and proper patient selection criteria. In this publication, we actually look at the effect of vertical seal repair before ICSI. There are not many studies in the literature, but what we found is that in terms of the clinical pregnancy, we might be able to increase clinical pregnancy by treating varicocele before ICSI. The odds ratio in this study was 1.59 higher among treated patients. Not only clinical pregnancy, but in the studies looking at reporting live birth, they were also confirming that treatment of varicocele could actually bring a positive impact on live birth outcomes among patients undergoing assisted reproductive technology with use of intracytoplasmic sperm injection. In this paper by our own group, we look at clinical outcome of ICSI in men with treated and untreated clinical varicocele. Our patient population comprised of 80 patients in which microsurgical varicocele repair, as I showed before, was performed before ICSI 
and 160 patients approximately in which in which ICSI was carried out without the varicose seal being treated. What we found in this study is that the embryonic outcomes and also pregnancy outcomes were significantly better in patients treated of the varicose seal. Fertilization rates, live birth rates were increased among treated patients, whereas miscarriage rates were decreased in the group of patients treated before intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So you might consider offering your patient population varicose repair before ICSI, in particular if the patient experienced previous ICSI failure. We have shown this information to you before, but just to stress this fact again, that even in patients with non-obstructive azospermia, there might be a role for varicose seal repair. This systematic review and meta-analysis we conducted and published a few years ago confirmed that in selected patients, sperm could return to the ejaculate, thus avoiding the need of sperm retrieval. And even if two thirds of the patients will remain as ospermic after varicoselectomy, sperm retrieval success rate is significantly increased in patients actually subjected to varicose repair before ICSI and sperm retrieval. And live birth rates were also higher among the patients actually treated by the varicose seal. So we have provided some algorithms for actually help the doctors to kind of recommend varicoselectomy. There is a, a guidelines published by different uh, societies such as the American Urological Association, the European U Association of Urology indicating that the varicose seals could be treated if you have palpable clinical varicose seal associated with abnormal semen parameters, conventional semen parameters. And we added to the literature in our guideline publishing translational andrology and neurology, in which we provide some recommendation for treatment for patients with clinical varicose seal in which the conventional semen analysis is normal or is slightly abnormal in these conditions. When you have a clinical varicose seal, and remember, grade one varicose seal means a small varicose seal in which the veins are not visible or palpable at rest, but they are palpable with the aid of the Valsalva maneuver with the patient in a standing position. Grade two moderate varicose seals are those where the veins are palpable at rest with the patient standing but not visible. And grade three are the large varicose seals that you can see through the scrotal skin at rest. So if you have a patient with a palpable varicose seal and a, a normal semen analysis or a slightly abnormal semen analysis, which per se will not put the patient automatically in an indication for varicoselectomy according to the society guidelines, we propose in our guideline to add sperm DNA fragmentation testing to check if the patient has abnormal DNA fragmentation. And in that case, you will be able to confirm that oxidative stress is most likely playing a significant role to decrease sperm quality and varicose seal repair could be offered because it has been associated, as I showed you before, with significant reduction in sperm DNA fragmentation rates. And this translates in an increased chance of achieving pregnancy, both natural or using assisted reproductive technology. So according to the guidelines, we can offer varicoselectomy 
to infertile patients with abnormal conventional semen parameters. This has been endorsed by several societies. We can also offer varicose selectomy to patients with non-obstructive vasospermia who are ICSI candidates. And according to the guideline I just showed you by the Society for Translational Medicine, we can also offer treatment for patients with grades two and three varicocele with normal conventional semen parameters and abnormal high sperm DNA fragmentation or patients with small varicoceles with borderline or abnormal conventional semen parameters and high sperm DNA fragmentation. So now I want to move to my last point, which is a sperm retrieval for using in conjunction with ICSI in non azospermic men. The reason why we need to discuss this issue is because it's more and more common to see papers and discussion in meetings and with the doctors in the clinics using testicular sperm for ICSI in men with sperm in the ejaculate. So what would be the reason why we could consider using testicular sperm for non-azospermic men undergoing assisted reproductive technology. So the reason is the sperm DNA fragmentation values are significantly lower in the testicular specimens taken from the seminiferous tubules than the ejaculated sperm according to several publications. Usually, the sperm DNA fragmentation values are two to three times lower in the testicular specimens compared to ejaculated specimens of same men. So this is the main reason why the results concerning ART using testicular sperm when both ejaculated and testicular sperm are available could be considered in this patient population. As I said before, and I want to highlight here again, oxidative stress has a major role in provoking sperm DNA fragmentation. But it's important to realize that the main site of oxidative attack is during sperm transit through the epididymis and after ejaculation. So the reason why we have less sperm with the DNA fragmentation in testicular spe uh, specimens compared to ejaculated specimens is because testicular sperm have not undergone epididymis transit and attacked by free radicals, which is a prevailing condition in men with infertility. So taking sperm from the testes could actually help overcome the oxidative stress attack. Therefore, actually, we might be able to inject genomically intact sperm in ICSI treatment, thus actually increasing the chance of developing normal embryos. Actually, it's important to realize that the evidence concerning the negative influence of sperm DNA fragmentation on ICSI outcomes is increasing steadily. There are several studies, meta-analysis, confirming that both conventional IVF and ICSI outcomes are negatively affected by using sper a sperm with a, a high DNA fragmentation. So therefore, there's an opportunity to consider the use of testicular sperm for this patient population. We look at this issue, compiling the evidence from 40 studies, about 500 ICSI cycles in this publication we published in Fertility Sterility in 2017. And this publication, we found that the clinical pregnancy rate, miscarriage rates, and live birth rates were in favor of testicular sperm for ICSI as compared as ejaculated sperm in this patient population. So 
The conclusion of this study was that the testicular sperm for ICSI in patients with high post-testicular sperm DNA fragmentation improved the reproductive outcomes compared with ejaculated sperm. So it's important that you actually test, first of all, the patient to confirm that the patient has indeed high DNA fragmentation before offering testicular sperm ICSI for this patient population. After the publication of the systematic review and meta analysis I just showed you, more data came out in the literature concerning the effectiveness of testicular sperm for X in men with high DFI. We have more prospective and retrospective studies published recently, and all of them confirm that live birth rates or cumulative live birth rates, as in, the, in this study published by a group from Canada, these studies indicate that the chance of achieving a live birth is increased by use of testicular in preference over ejaculated sperm among men with confirmed high sperm DNA fragmentation in semen. So the current evidence from eight studies, including about 800 patients and about 800 ICSI cycle, cycles from eight countries indicate that ongoing pregnancy rate or live birth rates are significantly higher with testicular sperm than ejaculated sperm. So all these studies, without any exception, showed that pregnancy outcomes were increased by two, three times using testicular specimens in preference over ejaculated specimens in men with confirmed high sperm DNA fragmentation. So I advocate the use of testicular sperm for ICSI in selected patients. So in this publication, I put together an algorithm we use at Androferk for actually offering testicular sperm ICSI for these patients. So first of all, we test for sperm DNA fragmentation. In our scenario, we use the sperm chromatin dispersion test. So after confirming that the patient has high DFI, and high DFI in our scenario is when we have higher than 30%, 30%, 30%, 30% DFI, then we consider the patient a high DFI. We always check DNA fragmentation in neat semen after two days abstinence, remember, the lower the abstinence, the lower the DNA fragmentation. So it's important to kind of uh, set up a fixed ejaculatory abstinence to check for sperm DNA fragmentation in order to avoid false positive results. So one way to do that is to decrease the ejaculatory abstinence from five days, four days to two days. This is what we do. So if the DFI is higher than 30% in the neat semen in patients providing semen specimens for analysis after two days abstinence, we consider these patients eligible, potentially eligible for using testicular sperm for ICSI. But first of all, we look at if there is any correctable conditions associated with sperm DNA fragmentation, such as varicose cell lifestyle factors, genital infections, that could be treated before actually offering the patient this treatment modality. So if there is possibility to treat, we go ahead and treat the condition. If there's no possibility, we offer the patient testicular sperm for ICSI. However, if after treatment of the underlying conditions, the, after retesting, DFI is still high. We also offer these patients testicular sperm for ICSI. A word about cryptozoospermia, because in patients with rare sperm in the fresh ejaculate, that is the definition of a cryptozoospermia is when you don't find sperm in the semen specimen, but after centrifuga centrifugation you find rare sperm in the fresh ejaculate. This is the definition of cryptozoospermia. 
also in patients with severe oligozoospermia, uh, there are several authors actually exploring the possibility of using testicular sperm in preference over ejaculated sperm for ICSI. This is the latest systematic review and meta-analysis published last year in which a few studies actually have been included so far, including only 368 cycles. But in this, uh, in this uh, meta-analysis, the authors showed that the relative risk for pregnant success was actually increased when testicular in preference of ejaculated sperm were used for sperm injections. So in all studies published so far using cryptospermic patients, the authors have observed that actually testicular sperm could offer better results as compared as ejaculated sperm. However, a note of caution should be actually uh, made concerning the application of testicular ICSI for unselected infertile couples with ICSI failure. We should not recommend that based on the existing evidence, we should actually offer this opportunity after discussing with the patients the limitations of the sperm DNA fragmentation assays and also the limitations of the data because we do not have any randomized control trial so far in this, in this area. And also, we should actually think if the patient is eligible for this procedure, because as you know, sperm retrieval could be associated with complications, including infection, hematoma, or even testicular atrophy. Although the complication rates are of 5%, and lower, we should not apply this procedure to unselect the infertile patient population until we have more data supporting the routine utilization for this patient population. However, in a study we published in 2015, comparing the reproductive outcomes in oligosospermic men in our patient population, oligosospermic men were those between five and 15, million per ml and high sperm DNA fragmentation, meaning DFI of 30% and higher using the sperm chromatin dispersion uh, test, we confirmed that testicular sperm provided better outcomes compared to ejaculated sperm. And we calculated the patients needed to be treated by testicular ICSI, sperm ICSI versus ejaculated ICSI to achieve one additional delivery. And we found out that five patients actually needed to be treated by ICSI with testicular sperm compared with ICSI with ejaculated sperm to achieve one additional delivery. So the number of patients we need to treat is not that big, so, and although more invasive treatments will be actually offered for men, well, on the other hand, we will be able to have fewer invasive treatment for women, considering ovarian stimulation or oocyte pickup, thus providing this patient a better opportunity to achieve a live birth after ICSI. So as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, we have several medical and surgical treatment options available for men with infertility. It's important to do the proper male infertility workup, identify the factors affecting fertility that could be lifestyle, environmental and occupational toxicant exposure, that could be actually medical conditions such as infections, systemic diseases, endocrine diseases, vertical cell. And then we could actually discuss with the patient the possibility of offering treatment. And if treatment is not available, we could then offer assisted reproductive technology 
And if there's ICSI failure and the patient has high sperm DNA fragmentation or cryptozoospermia, severe oligozoospermia, we could consider the use of ICSI using testicular sperm. So as key messages concerning the surgical treatment of male infertility, first of all, first of all varicose repair is helpful to improve overall semen quality. We might offer the patient increased chance of live birth concerning both natural pregnancy and ART. But remember that the patient selection is critical. We need to offer varicose seal repair to patients with palpable varicose seal with abnormal conventional semen analysis or abnormal sperm DNA fragmentation results. Secondly, reproductive tract reconstruction is a valid option for selected men with obstructive azospermia. And testicular sperm might increase ARC outcomes for selected non-obstructive, non-azospermic men with high DFI or cryptozoospermia or severe oligozoospermia. So the final remarks I want to leave you, first of all, we as individuals and as a medical community must consider if you are providing the best care to the infertile couple and the offspring by ignoring the health of the male. Secondly, we must confront the non-medical reasons that might impact the decision of whether or not to fully work up and treat the male or bypass male factor infertility through ICSI. The diagnosis and treatment of the male has the objective of not only improving the quality of life and enhancing fertility of the father, both natural and assisted, but also to improve the health of the offspring. Thank you very much. So with that, we conclude the series of four webinars sponsored by Indira IVF. I was extremely help, uh, glad to be able to discuss issues about male infertility that I consider so important and it's part of my life. I thank you, all of you, for the attention, for the interaction. And I hope you have enjoyed as much as I did participate in these webinars. And I hope to see you soon somewhere in future webinars or presential meetings. Thank you very much. So the, the question is in center, which doesn't have sperm DNA fragmentation facility, how long is the best duration for abstinence prior X in patients with severe OAT? Does abstinence more than three days will increase oxidative stress in comparison to one day abstinence? This is an important question. And yes, abstinence more than three days will increase oxidative stress and sperm DNA fragmentation in comparison to one day abstinence. We have published a study in urology journal uh, showing that we took a, a group of a men and asked these patients to provide semen specimens with different abstinence intervals one day, two days, three days, five days, seven days, and 11 days. And then we checked conventional semen parameters, sperm DNA fragmentation, oxidative stress markers, and we observed that the lower the abstinence period, period, the lower the sperm DNA fragmentation. In this particular study, which corroborates data published by other investigators, one day abstinence is actually the interval that could offer the lowest DNA fragmentation rates. So, Going to the practical aspect of this question, I do believe that for ICSI, we should actually utilize the abstinence period of just one day. This is what we do at Underfert at the moment. We only utilize uh, 
abstinence period of one day. So all patients enrolled in our program, they have ejaculation at home the day before and the day of ICSI, they come to the clinic, even if it's less than one day, sometimes it's two hours, doesn't matter. We just need few sperm for ICSI. And the data confirms that if you kind of apply this uh, protocol as a routine, you might be able, in case the patient has high DFI, to kind of overcome not all cases, but in some case, the sperm DNA fragmentation. It's important to realize that the, the decrease in abstinence uh, period will not help all patients indiscriminately. We have looked at this data as well. And in some patients, even after decreasing the abstinence period, sperm DNA fragmentation remains high. But I could say that in about 60% of patients, we will be able to offer some help in terms of decreasing sperm DNA fragmentation levels by decreasing abstinence period. So yes, I do think that this is a strategy that could be considered in centers without sperm DNA fragmentation facility. Well, in the case, obviously, the discussion I had today about testicular use of testicular sperm for ICSI in men with high DFI in the ejaculated specimens concerned patients in which you have sperm in the ejaculate. Therefore, you should not have any difficulties to find the sperm in the testicle by using any sperm retrieval method. So the question is different here, is regards the lesson we had uh, last week, in which if we only have spermatid, how to proceed? Well, first of all, you need to consider what kind of method of sperm retrieval you have utilizing. Because if the conventional testicular biopsy open method using single or multiple biopsy, you might not be able to kind of scan the full uh, testicle and you might miss a seminiferous tubules with, let's say, full sperm production that could be actually identified using the microdissection testicular sperm extraction. The other thing you need to consider is that if you have actually applied the steps that are needed to improve the chance of sperm retrieval, including medical treatment of this patient population, especially among men with lower testosterone levels in which you could boost intratesticular testosterone production using HCG and eventually FSH, or patient with clinical varicocele and non-obstructive azospermia that you could consider treating the varicocele before the sperm retrieval as a means to improve the chance of retrieving mature sperm from a testicular biopsy. So please consider that you need to kind of look at these conditions, method of sperm retrieval, first of all, interventions to improve success of sperm retrieval. And in the case you only have spermatid, you might actually discuss with the patient if the patient wants to go ahead and try sperm injection with spermatid. The results are very poor. The literature in the groups actually with experience in spermatid injection, they report live birth rates of below 5%. So the effectiveness of this technology is very poor at the moment. There are some efforts being uh, actually conducted by different investigators trying to do sperm maturation in the laboratory, but so far results are poor, especially with round spermatid.
For patients who were treated with azithromycin, when do you need to repeat the semen analysis to check reduction of infection symptoms? Well, this is important, uh, yeah, important questions and I want to make a yeah, important clarification. Well, azithromycin could be, uh, could be a proper treatment for patients with subclinical infection. These patients with subclinical infection, they do not have obvious infection symptoms. These patients are those in which you identify the subclinical infection by increasing leukocyte number. As I mentioned in the talk, you do the leukocyte count uh, you, and the distinct, uh, distinction between the leukocytes and other round cellular elements using the peroxidase test. And after confirming that the leukocyte count is over 1 million per ml, you kind of consider the patient as having subclinical infection. So azithromycin is okay in that patient scenario. And in this case, you repeat the semen analysis at least two weeks after actually completing treatment. So this is what we do. For patients with infection symptoms in which you have symptoms of urethritis or you have actually symptoms of prostatitis, ideally, we should provide these patients long-term antibiotic use for at least 15 days. In that case, you can use doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day for 14 days or up to three weeks. And you can use also uh, ciprofloxacin for this patient population as well to actually treat the clinical infection. So it's important to make this distinction and then offer azithromycin as a single dose, one gram for the couple, for the patient with subclinical infections. In turn, if the patient has a sperm in the ejaculate, and high DNA fragmentation, then you are offering the patient the opportunity to do testicular sperm mixing. No, there's no correlation with FSH levels. In this patient population, you'll be able to find sperm in virtually all cases. However, for patients with non-obstructive azospermia, and then you might think that the FSH levels could play a role in terms of the success of sperm retrieval, the data uh, indicates that FSH levels provide a marker of global testicular function. So high FSH levels indicate that the spermatogenesis is disrupted, but it will not actually indicate that the patient has any focal area of complete spermatogenesis within the testicle. So for patients with non-obstructive azospermia undergoing sperm retrieval, I do not rely on FSH levels as a marker to kind of deselect patients from sperm retrieval. I know that in patients with high FSH levels, the testicular condition is not good and this is one of the situations that confirm the diagnosis of non-obstructive azospermia, but I do not use the FSH level to, to actually confirm that the patient will or not be eligible for sperm retrieval because the accuracy of FSH levels to, uh, to actually provide a marker of sperm retrieval success is very poor is around 50% only accuracy, which is not actually a good marker to evaluate if a patient with non-obstructive azospermia will have any sperm in the TESA in the testicular sperm uh, uh, aspiration or extraction. 
So do not actually rely on these levels to kind of confirm or advise the patients to not embark on sperm retrieval. Remember, Kleinfelter syndrome patients that could have sperm retrieved by microsurgical uh, testicular sperm extraction often have FSH levels higher than 30. And still, these patients could actually have sperm retrieved by the proper sperm retrieval method. For patients with a uh, normal sperm count and a uh, zero percent motility, even after treatment, we do ICSI with testicular sample or ejaculated sample. I do believe that in this case you should do ICSI with testicular specimen in preference over ejaculated specimen. Well, you can check viability because uh, if it's zero percent motility we you could have two different conditions the complete astenosospermia which refers to zero percent motility could be caused by genetic condition for instance uh, ciliary disorders affecting the uh, sperm exonym in this condition Viability will be normal. Let's say the patient could have 60% and over uh, viable spur in the ejaculated specimen, but all of them will be emotile. So in this condition, actually, taking spur from the testes or ejaculate will not actually make a significant difference. But this is a uh, rare condition affecting sperm motility. Most patients we will have low motility caused by epididymis dysfunction that could be post-infection for instance and in that condition it's very likely that sperm dna fragmentation will be increased in ejaculated specimens so i would suggest you to strongly consider use of testicular sample in preference over ejaculated sample for patients in which you have normal or slightly abnormal sperm count and 0% motility. You can take sperm with the testicular aspiration, with the open biopsy, the way you feel more comfortable with, and the results should be actually confirmatory of a uh, good outcome using ICSI with testicular specimens. Uh, okay, sir, this completes our question answers also. And uh, I'm very thankful to you that you have taken up uh, such a long session for us uh, that all together on a four, all four days and uh, uh, good wisdom about the immediate infertility. How to go ahead and uh, how to evaluate, how to uh, do medical management and how to do the surgical procedures and all. And it's uh, a pleasure to hear you, sir. I hope uh, uh, we'll see you again on certain platform, uh, the same Indra platform or another platform, sir. So thank you very much for being with me uh, in these webinars. I know this is a um, long talks because we need to kind of go into detail. Obviously, male infertility goes far beyond the uh, the topics that we have discussed in these webinars there are more issues to cover i tried to kind of bring together the things that i consider more important for you as clinicians working in uh, fertility center i would like to thank you dr murdia for actually uh, sponsoring this initiative for you dr vipin for actually being with me and all the doctors all the embryologists from different centers join the webinars and interact with me thank you very much for being so active being so participant i was very glad to be able to discuss these issues with you 
I included a literature that I considered could be a uh, literature that you should have in your in your desk in your computer as guidance to help uh, providing even better care to the patients you see in your clinics. I have included the slides for you and feel free to use these slides and also to kind of to kind of a, uh, provide care to the infertility patients using these resources I shared with you. It was great pleasure and I wish all the best to all of you. Thank you very much and yes. have a great day. Thank you, sir. And uh, I hope someday we'll see, see you in Udaipur. I will invite you. It's an informal invitation from us. So do come uh, to Udaipur and visit our, our hospital someday. If Thank you very much. It will be a fantastic opportunity. I'm looking forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.